This is George Dion with Metal Express Radio, and I'm here with James Rivera of Hellstar. How are you doing today, James? Hey, I'm hanging in there. Hanging in there, Jorge. <laughs> awesome. If I knew absolutely nothing about Hellstar, how would you describe the band's music to me? I always tell people, put Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, Dio, Old Scorpions, uh, a sprinkle of UFO, and some Slayer and good old Metallica. Put it in a blender and go to the smoothie store and say, I want the Hell Star. And that's what we are tasting like. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that sounds pretty accurate to me. That's the flavor you'll get. Yeah. Oh, and I forgot a little bit of Cradle of Filth, too. Yeah, ah, there you go. There's the. That can't is forget the, that. That's one hell of a smoothie. <laughs> Your new album, Clad in Black, comes out April 2nd on Massacre Records. Not really a new album per se. It's more of a compilation. So if you want to explain a little bit what fans will be getting if they pick up the new Clad in Black uh, release. Well, <clears throat> what, what you'll be getting is you get a, you're getting basically an EP with Clad in Black as, as far as the Clad in Black EP. Um, when you're getting three new Hellstar songs um that are going to be on the full length album to give the fans a taste of what have they been doing since vampiro uh five years ago what fans got vampiro which leads to the whole reason why vampiro was released again uh, along with clad in black to make a nice digi pack and the reason for it is because even just recently doing some interviews with some guys they were like yeah i mean Dude, it, just by chance, I found that Vampiro, but I, I didn't even know it was out there. So when you start hearing that, and Vampiro was such the biggest comeback for Hellstar, musically, theme-wise, everything, and you know that the, the, the access to it was very minimal, that kind of kills you. And you're like, well, let's get it out there again. There's a lot of people that missed it. And, you know, so that was the whole purpose of why Clad in Black came out the way that it did. Okay. Um, the new songs, are they in the same vein as the Vampiro release, I guess, thematically? M would... Musically, they are. Uh, lyrically, uh, some songs will be. Um, it, it's not like the whole album is going to be that way again, but it's because of the fact that, uh, because of the love and support that I got from the guys in the band, and they realize how much I'm so into the vampire thing. And, and now <laughs> that I've, I've found my persona my image, my whole everything on stage with not only on stage, but with the fans. I mean, the, the fans do not even want a photo with me unless I'm ha wearing the damn fangs, you know? So <laughs> it's, <laughs> I know. So, uh, with that going on, then I made the, um, fairness, uh, and, and deal with them to say that they don't, they don't necessarily ha all have to write about vampires because Larry is the other main lyricist. And so is Andrew now. That, you know, I'll always write about vampires, but you can write about whatever you want to write about. And so with that, it, in all fairness, it doesn't it doesn't just cage everybody in. And um, so, we, you know, if you listen to the three new songs, Dark Incarnation is about an evil satanic witch. But in my eyes, I still have a way of tying in the vampire thing, you know, being being stubborn. Yeah, but it's Dracula's cousin. <laughs> you know, and, so, and then uh, across the rage and seas is about uh, kamikaze pilots, and I go, yeah, but, but they were they were hypnotized by Dracula to crash into those ships. No, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like that little kid that just doesn't want to let go of the one, only one way that he thinks. Um, and Black Wings of Solitude, yes, is about a, a vampire who who wants to try to become mortal and human because he falls in love with this girl and he can't so you see so it and then, yes so obviously i wrote that you know the lyrics to that the majority <laughs> on so it, it's that's what people can expect on the full length album um we don't have a title for it yet we have several ideas but um those three songs will be on the album as well and we also felt by giving people just a little bit at a time we didn't. We want to try to keep the band's name out there and giving people a little bit at a time instead of one whole album. And then, well, haven't heard from those guys in three years, <laughs> you know. So this was a way to put out a product, almost three products in one year, and uh, and it's working. So 
there you go. <laughs> so as it been challenging because of the lockdown to kind of put a full album together or are you just really enjoying this little bits at a time? Yeah, we're enjoying the, it's it's it uh, it's a combination of both. It is. Um we know that we we've got more time because things got pushed back cuz of covid. So we are taking a little bit more time with the songwriting process. <clears throat> but um you know, there's it, really at the end of the day we when we were just talking about it the other day and with all the songs that Larry has finished, not necessarily lyric wise, but musically and the two that Andrew have, the whole album's already written. It's just now a matter of us going and recording. And because of COVID, yes, we have to be careful how we do that. Like Larry doesn't want a bunch of people at the studio at one time. So we all have to pick our day when, you know, we want to go and I want to go do vocals for another one. And, uh, so it, the COVID thing is is stepping in the way quite a bit. Sure. Um, obviously, the vampire thing runs through Hellstar's career quite a bit. Uh, you had the Nosferatu album in 1989 and then Vampiro in 2016. When did you first start getting into or get intrigued by the whole vampire uh Thing. Well, I was very much when I was a child, you know, when I was raised on the, going to the movies. Of course, that was the good old days when you got a triple feature for 50 cents. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, so you saw Dracula has risen from the grave, the horror of Dracula and Brides of Dracula all on one Sunday afternoon. Pow! <laughs> so, of course, that I was always intrigued by those then. But once we did, once we did Nosferatu, I can say that 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 transformed my soul, my whole uh, image, my whole train of thinking. And um, you know, I remember, you know, that's kind of when I just started wearing nothing but black, and I remember my whole apartment was decorated with anything that had to do with bats or vampires, or I even wanted a real African fruit bat, and then I found out that. Um, they're hard to keep in <laughs> captivity and there's so much money to get them here. And, and you know, when you don't know nothing about something like that, you know, you, you're stupid and you're just thinking like, you know what, I'm going to get me an African fruit bat. They only eat bananas. I mean, how expensive can that be? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so I actually, I actually had an appointment with the zookeeper at the Houston zoo. And, uh, I even took my note, my tablet for notes and, and she sat me down and gave me the horror story of it all. She sent me away almost crying and she gave me a hug and I said, no, I wouldn't want that. You know, so, so she, she told me, she said, well, first of all, and she, she thought it was cute. And she goes, well, first of all, you're going to have to have an aquarium about this. And she showed me the size of it, which would probably be equivalent to like the whole wall of your large living room. Because they have to spread their wings for uh, exercise. And I said, oh. And, and when I said, what do you mean they? She goes, oh, that's the other thing. You can't just get one. They have to have a mate. That's the only way that they, they can sort of survive in captivity. And I'm like, oh, so I got to get two. Yeah. So, and then, <laughs> then she goes, and the chances of them living in captivity, like what you're thinking, is about a 10% chance. So you're probably going to end up with two dead African bats. And I'm like, no, I, I can't do that. You know? So uh, it changed my mind quickly. And I walked out of there feeling like Charlie Brown, you know, so, <laughs> <laughs> I got rid of that idea real quick. And, uh, yeah, but uh, I, I, so when Nosferatu came out, of course, I read Bram Stoker's a hundred times, watched every movie that I could think of. Um, any novel, anything, and Rice, and it just so it, it started then, and this that's how it all began. So, from a movie standpoint, which Dracula do you think was presented best? Because the ones you talked about seeing at the movies, those Draculas were were pretty tame. Uh, like the, uh, the the Hammer film ones, yeah, I, I, those are my favorite ones. They were yeah. tame compared to what came out later in the future. Now, uh, I did like Bram Stoker's Dracula. Uh, yeah. And then there was a couple of other ones that came out that were even more on the violent side. Uh, Dracula 2000, I believe it was. And uh, But those really still are my favorite, only because although they were tame, it was the first uh, image of Dracula being darker and satanic, which Christopher Lee just did a, a, a fantastic job. And he was the first one to bring out the the red inside the cave and it, it looked devilish 
you know, and I just love the way that he never really said much in any of the movies. He always pointed, you know, and I, did, I remember like in Dracula has risen from the grave, which that's the one where he dies or falls on the cross uh, because they, they take it off the door and they throw it down the mountain and it just happens to land standing straight up, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> I remember I think in that whole movie, the only thing he ever said is when he went to his castle because they they put it, they tied it in front of his door so he couldn't go in. He was pissed and he's dragging that chick with him and he throws her to the ground. And he goes, take that thing out of my sight. That's all he says through the whole movie. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you're releasing Clad in Black on multiple formats. Uh, one of them is vinyl. Uh, are you a fan of vinyl yourself? Yeah, I am. Yeah. Though I don't have a record player, but you know, I just I still miss the big, the big album artwork. That's you know when 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 you were younger. I don't know about you, but when I was younger, you'd be surprised how many albums you bought just because of the artwork. You know, in an album, you, you looked at the album, you're like, wow, this looks badass. I'm buying it, you know. And and most of the time, eh, you know, like eight out of ten, seven out of ten times, you came home with something cool. Sometimes it was like, man, this sucks, you know. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, what? wow, Blue Earth to Cold. I wonder what these guys are all about. Look at the album cover, though, you know. And that's how, yeah. I, that's how I discovered Judas Priest and stuff like that, you know. So, um I guess that's what I like about vinyl. Is it? Yeah, it, it, it's the full picture of everything, you know. Well, I mean, that was really the only way. Well, the only way, if you weren't on the radio, to try to sell your album was to have an eye-catching picture or name your exactly band with an yeah. A. <laughs> so everybody yeah. started first. Yeah, exactly. Uh, your first album with Hellstar was in 1984, going back to the vinyl days, uh, Burning Star. Uh, what do you remember about recording that album? I remember, it, ironically, and the reason why it came up, as I just mentioned to you earlier in this, because you're up in Massachusetts, where you get the damn good clam chowder and lobster rolls, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, uh, the third that was uh, 30-something years ago, that's the last time Houston had the freak freeze of the weather going below 15 degrees. Yeah, and but we didn't have as much trouble then for some weird reason like this time, last time around. But uh, and we had that freeze at that time, and we were recording at that time. And I remember everybody piling up at my house because I lived the furthest. And of course, we had those little old gas heaters, man. I mean, it was freezing to death, you know. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but uh, that's what I remember about it the most. And it was, and of course, that that was the, the album that gave me the other nickname, Bill Lionel. Just because the, the producers thought it, Carl Kennedy was one of them, you know, and that they came down from New York, and they thought it was cute that they called me Bill, and it's just like the old saying that instead of saying "Hey man," I used to say "Hey Bill, check it out, man," and so everybody was kind of Bill, but because I started it, I'm the original Bill, and that is, I just sort of became Bill, and to this day, there are certain friends from that time call, I guess we call them borderline high school friends, but to this day, we're still good friends. I still have some very close friends from that time period and they don't call me james and they've they've even advanced it to hey billy check it out and i'm <laughs> so <it's, laughs> yeah so there were some pretty weird times about that <laughs> i guess so yeah uh, if, if they don't call me billy they're calling me vampiro so it's one or the other hey vampiro you need another beer yeah i'll take another beer all right or hey billy <laughs> want another shot yeah yeah i'll take another shot it's like what happened to my name james <laughs> <laughs> Well, as long as they're not calling you asshole, you're good to go. Yeah, right? that's true. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I noticed in my research that you guys opened for Striper. That seems sort of a mismatch to me. Yeah, and there was, well, it was really much of a mismatch because it just goes to prove how Christianity, most of it, is all about bullshit and goddamn money anyways. And so that was a, a promoter that was uh, bringing uh, Striper to Houston Coliseum. The Houston Coliseum is where I would go see Judas Priest and Blue Horse the Cult and UFO and Black Sabbath and the, the, the dream of any guy starting in a band, a garage band going, yeah, I wanna, dude, I'm going to play the Houston Coliseum one day. That was the, that was the drill. Um, he called my house and said that he, his name was this and that. And he said, how would Hellstar like to play the Houston Coliseum? And I said, are you shitting me? I said, of course. And, and, and then, 
then he started explaining to me. He goes, he goes, well, he says, let me give you my address and come to my office and I want you to talk to me. And I said, okay. So me and my bass player went over there and that's what it was, was he said that we're bringing in Striper to the Houston Coliseum. And right now they actually have a band called Heaven on tour with him for the whole tour. But in <laughs> you, but in, I have the right to do what I want. And here in Houston, I want Hellstar on the bill instead of Heaven. And I said, why? He goes, because right now you guys are the bomb. And that means more ticket sales to me. And more ticket sales means more money to me. <laughs> Just like that. And I said, oh, I get it now. Hmm, hmm. How much? Well, I was thinking, and I said, ah, I don't know about that. <laughs> and so I knew this guy was all about money. At the time we left there, he hated me. But we got the gig. <laughs> and was it really worth it in the end? Sure it was, because it put us in front of 2,500 people. But... 1500 of those people were strictly there for the word of God and Striper. And those 1500 people were the first ones to be able to buy their tickets because Hellstar wasn't announced right away. So all the <laughs> Hellstar fans got all the, the seats in the back in the upper arenas. So those people started throwing Bibles at us. And then the next thing you know, Hellstar fans are throwing full beers at them and then going around beating them up and stealing their Striper shirts. <laughs> And I said, so much for the name of God, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you probably got along with Striper, right? Your fans didn't yes, really interact. Yes, we well, did. We actually did. did. Yeah, we did. Yeah, they're, they're, they were really nice guys. <laughs> <laughs> so in addition to Hellstar, are you still working with Shadows Keep? No, what, right? Well, not, not necessarily that it's not going to happen again. It's just right now, no, because of the whole COVID and you know, I think Nikki and Chris are just sort of licking their wounds a little bit because they were expecting a little bit more to happen with the album after all the money they spent. But, you know, when certain labels just, uh, you, you know, you're not going to squeeze blood out of a turnip, you know, and I, I try to explain that to them. Uh, of course, you know, that's their band. It's not mine. So um, right. I, I really don't have uh, much I can say about that. <laughs> Do you have any touring opportunities like within your grasp over the next year or so, or are you just still sitting it out waiting to see? Yeah, we're we're hoping that we're going to be able to to tour, um, you know, sometime, or at least start doing some shows in fall. You know, or, I mean, at least regionally and 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 in Texas, of course, um, mm -hmm. and maybe some some uh, dates outside of Texas. Like I know California is interested in uh, in a little round of shows right now too. Uh, and, you know, the only the, the problem that we see with that is that, you know, all we're, the problem that we see is that even though like right now, Texas is at 100 percent capacity. I mean, we're back to 100 percent open. We can you can have 100 percent of clubs, restaurants, whatever. They even lifted the mask mandate. The problem, though, is that the clubs are still hurting so bad that they can't guarantee the band what the band is used to asking for. And, right. you know, and so and and the reason why they can't is just because everything's open. So it's a combination of a million things. So they're out of money. Number one, anyways. Number two, if the if if we were convinced that 100 percent of the people are going to come, let used to come back in the normal day, then it might be safe for them. But right now, even just because there's 100 percent capacity, there's still a lot of people in fear of doing anything. And they say that's the way it's going to be for a while. I ain't going nowhere. Fuck that shit. You know, and so, you know, so with that going on, then it's like, well, I tell you what, man, I really would like to have you guys. And uh, I, I mean, uh, you know, but, you know, you know, I'm hurting. You know, I'm hurting. Uh, Van Pito. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, I could do a door deal. No, no. And the thing is, when, when you're a band that's already used to a certain uh, stature of how you, you conduct business, once you go down that hole, you will never crawl out of it again. And yeah, so that's what, and it's not like, oh, it's all about the money. No, it's not all about the money, but we're a band that's been around for 30 something years. And yes, we have a certain level of things that I know we're not asking for what, you know, not even asking for a speck of dust on the head of a pen of what a band like Metallica makes, but hey, we, we, we deserve a little respect. And that was never a problem to go, hey, this is what we want. Houston knows what they pay us all the time. They don't even, they don't even argue about it. We don't even have to discuss business anymore. 
all of, you know the main venue here in Houston when it was the good old days just says hey James about another Hell Star show I'm looking at April blah, blah, blah. yeah let's do it we didn't even talk about money because we they already know what to expect well see now it's all different and so you you kind of have to we kind of have to just wait and and do things uh, fully the way they used to be that's all it is understandable uh that's all i got for you today james i appreciate you taking the time i wish you good luck on uh clad in black coming out april 2nd yeah yeah man well thank you so much thank you for the interview and i'm i'm very hopeful that uh you know we'll get up to that area we've been dying to get up to massachusetts regardless and uh as a matter of fact in salem is where i my fangs come from it's called oh. uh, uh yeah vamped uh, uh vampire fangs it's called vamped and the company always has a, a vampire ball every year and uh i'm, I'm dying to get up there man <laughs> yeah i'd love to see you live i i haven't had the pleasure yet i'd love to see you well, that'd be great, man. And when I do see you, I'll give you a hug. We'll drink a beer and we'll have some good clam chowder. All right. Take it easy.